Um, hello, everybody. I hope you can uh, hear me. Um, tonight, we're going to be covering uh, neural networks for sequences. It's the last part of um, the section in the book on neural networks. Um, Pinku Dibnath will be presenting this, and I'd like to thank him very much because he wasn't the original presenter, and uh, the presenter canceled early last week, so he didn't have a lot of time to prepare. So let's be very uh, nice with him because he uh, <laughs> was willing to uh, present tonight, and I thank you for that. So uh, whenever you're ready, uh, go ahead. Yeah, so chapter 15 focuses on neural networks for sequences. So in this chapter, we will get an overview of recurrent neural networks, uh, 1D CNNs, ATMs, and transformers. There are other like examples. Uh, uh, we, will, we'll, we did not get time. Uh, I will not get time for those. So for recurrent neural networks, we will see applications and backpropagation through time, gated uh, recurrent units, LSTMs, and beam search. And in transformers, we'll get an idea of the main key components. So first of all, what are sequences? Sequences are like uh, data which have uh, temporal or sequential relationships like uh, sentences or music. So well, the tasks that we can perform or we, we, we need to perform our classification generation. For classification, it's like uh, speech recognition, uh, video activity recognition, and for generation, we could like uh, generate music or machine translation. Uh, computers do not understand words, musical notations or video frames. So they kind of understand binary data. So we need to encode each word into tokens that the computer can understand. So one way is to uh, encode them using one hot encoding. So in one hot encoding, there is like a long array where each of the indices uh, represent words. And if the word, and there's only one for the respective word that the, like the one hot encode representing and rest of the words are zeros. And, and yeah, basically that's, and word to vec is like, uh, it changes the representation of the uh, one hot encoding to a smaller dimension. So there's like a pretend uh, word to vec models where one of them is uh, globe. <sighs> and so embeddings replace the words uh, per unit time step. So we cannot, uh, we prefer not to use fully connected neural networks because uh, inputs and outputs are not fixed in length. Uh, the sequences can vary. And also like there's, there are relationships in sequential data uh, related to its previous and uh, future time steps. So fully, uh, fully connected models do not utilize those. So we need special type of model designs. So usually we use recurrent neural networks. So in recurrent neural networks, a hidden state is propagated through time. So this hidden state kind of carries the context of input or other time steps. Uh, we could have, so for input and output, we have fixed uh, time lengths. Uh, this time length is very large to incorporate like uh, our expected maximum size of input and output. So every sentence is, end of every sentence is characterized by a special character. We usually call it a US character. And after the US character, the remaining positions stay empty. And there are other concepts like teacher forcing uh, versus shuttle sampling. So teacher forcing is usually used during the training session where the output is fixed. So we are trying to force the model to match with the output. Uh, and in shuttle sampling, it's like uh, the output that's generated in the previous time step is feed forward is input in the next time step. So usually during the training session, we usually use teacher forcing, but sometimes we use shuttle sampling to make it more generalized. 
and uh, reduce overfitting. There's then the concept called vanishing and exploding gradients that's common in uh, large networks. So what happens like since the gradient is less than one, and if we multiply them many times, the value like approaches zero. So there are many techniques to like implementation techniques to reduce this uh, vanishing and exploding gradients. Uh, one of them is uh, gradient clipping. So we kind of clip the gradients so that uh, multiplication don't get too small. And there's another concept of spectral re maintaining the spectral radius of the weight vectors near to one. So the way to understand spectral radius is that uh, if we do some sort of PCF of the space, then how oval the shape is. So if the spectral radius is close to one, then the spec then the shape would be like a circle. And if it is too like skewed, then it would be like a very oval shape. <sighs> okay, and another way to tackle the vanishing gradient is to use GRU or LSTM. Okay, there are different uh, designs of recurrent neural networks uh, based on how many inputs and outputs there are. So we could have vector to sec. So in this model, like uh, uh, there is only one input and the output is generated from the input, from a single input. So this is usually used for language modeling as such like uh, we're trying to predict. Uh, okay, we are trying to, am I audio first? Okay, yeah, sorry. So we are trying to predict the probability of a particular sentence. So that's called for the language modeling. So here the equation's a bit complicated, but what it really means like given the, wait, there is an annotation. Okay, given, so it's like a conditional uh, probability. So given X, we are trying to predict this sequence of y. So this can be translated to summation of uh, given x when trying to predict the hidden state and the y. And since y also depends on the hidden state and the input, so we have y depending on hidden state and the probability of hidden state given the, uh, sorry, okay previous hidden state, uh, previous output and y, uh, sorry, x. Okay, now this, this one is like this one. So we're, so this equation is kind of, we could use to predict uh, this probability, we could use the model, any model. Uh, and this model would be predict y such that a function of a linear, uh, mapping of the hidden state and uh, uh, what is it called uh, by uh, some sort of bias. So hidden state, it's like a linear mapping of the previous hidden state. Okay. So this S could usually is softmax. And for model, we could use a norm, a uh, Gaussian distribution. And yeah, basically that. And this is the for Gaussian distribution. This would be the mean, and this is the standard deviation. Uh, so yeah, basically that. Okay, here, which one is this? This one is oh, this one is uh, this one, right? So here, it's kind of a hard probability where the hidden state uh, it gives the probability uh, that the hidden state is this value. So what's this? Uh, okay, it's something. But basically, it's 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 a bit. It shows a deterministic relationship. And then there's this hidden state, which is a sigmoid mapping the. Okay, so it's mapping the. X and Y and the previous hidden state plus a bias. 
So this HD is the, the next step, uh, hidden state. Yeah, sorry, it's not that clear. Okay, so another design of recurrent neural network is that we have input, like we have a sequence uh, as input and the output is just a vector. So this is usually done for classification. So we can see here, like there's a sequence of input and the output, single output. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, sorry, this one is the previous. So the yeah, next step is the we could have a sequence for input and a sequence for. Oh, this is so confusing. To really clear. Okay, so yeah, so we have, could have a vector for output. So, so uh, we are going this like from one side to another, like left to right. We could also have a bidirectional uh, recurrent neural network where the we are the we are checking from right to left so this is this direction so first uh for this sequence to vector we have we are putting the single y given a sequence given the last hidden state so here t means the, like the last position so here suppose here t is three so given the last hidden state uh, we're trying to predict the output and this output only depends on the hidden state and the previous calculations apply here also. Uh, for the bidirectional uh, R RNN, we have we maintain two types of hidden state. One goes from left, and another goes to from right. So they have the similar functions. And the hidden state for a given position is includes both from the right and left. And here we meant for predicting why we kind of aggregate all the hidden states and then run that hidden state through a linear transformation. So another design is sequence to sequence, which is usually required for translation. Here we have two, two variations. One is uh, aligned in, that means like uh, the size of input and output are same. We could also have unaligned where, which means like, like the inputs and outputs are of different length. Okay, so here Tx means the size of the input and Ty means the size of the output. Okay, now, so here the, in this probability, we are seeing like given this input, uh, we're trying to predict the output. Here T means like the final length. So this probability could be like a summation of, hmm. so this summation is running from one to T. So let's go through one of them. Suppose uh, the index is one. So in that case, uh, okay. Uh, this is going like uh, given this hidden state. So this is running from here and like it's uh, for every tensor, we are trying to calculate the probability of that state and summing this up. So here, this one is that total probability. And usually we have a initial hidden state. This hidden state is this H1. So usually we give it like a zero vector or it could be random or it could be some sort of function. So F0 means like the initial hidden state. And here, this one is like, uh, okay. And this is like in general, like a, in general, we depending on like the previous hidden state and, oh, sorry, this is the layer one. Like we could stack one, like we could have a multiple layers of hidden layers. And this L means like this hidden, suppose a hidden state in one layer could depend on the previous layer and also the hidden state in the previous time step. So that's what it means. And this is like the final output depending on the final hidden state layer and the final T. 
and then and then mapping it to the output okay so so we have seen like the case where the input and output have the same length now we are seeing like an uh, unaligned which means like they can vary so this is like the most useful case where like most of the applications are here so here the network can be divided into two portions one is the encoder and the other is the decoder and we usually use this for machine translation from one or from language to another so here like the blue version blue area kind of shows like the encoder part and the red is the decoder so what happens usually is like the encoder kind of encodes into a context and that context is then used by the decoder so here we can see a example that demonstrating that we have a english sentence and that sentence is being translated to french so this is like hidden layer one and hidden layer two so here this l kind of represents the hidden layers so here look like, the hidden layer is kind of propagating it to the top also okay and the output usually depends on the top hidden layer okay and here it's showing like a greedy approach to selecting the words so first suppose after encoding it into a context the first for the first sent first word in french we have moi uh, with probability 0.4 since this has the highest probability we pick moi then and i'll put it here and based on conditioned on this output this output is then fed into as input in the next time step see and then the after conditioning it on moi the next output probability is maximum for swiss so we pick swiss and henceforth okay so there are the models but let's leave it there but now in the next concept we're going to see is back propagation through time so here the time concept comes because uh, we are kind of propagating like we are propagating the loss on uh, factors that depend on previous time steps so it's nothing special so the hidden state ht depends on the current input xt and the previous hidden state and output is like the mapping of the final hidden state uh, into something into the output space uh, we're writing them as simplified version here f as f and g and this is like the sum of like a total like this is the sum of a given sentence here t is like the total length and here we are met trying to match every generated output sorry uh, clear every generated output with the expected output and then summing it and giving it as uh, dividing it by the total length t here's the last characters might be just null like put of them since suppose that to our expected maximum length is 20 but usually the sentence are 10 so the rest of the 10 uh, words are just zero okay so we are we're going to propagate the loss by differentiated with respect to like the different parameters so here we're doing it on w sorry uh, h we could also be doing over x also so here we're just differentiating as usual and we as usual we use uh, chain chain rule for differentiation uh, okay so first we have this and here we are expanding this to this so there is ot so we have this ot here and for this ot to can cancel out we need again differentiate uh, ot with respect to ht and then henceforth okay so now this ht is this ht is this ht okay so this ht kind this ht is this comes from here so this uh, equation has two dependencies xt and ht1 ht minus 1 so we need to differentiate with respect to this and that 
so, so that's why we have two here, two parameters for these two uh, objects. So here we are differentiating with respect to WH. So here's the WH and HT minus one, where this is the part here. So here is this HT minus one. And then we're just expanding it. And here we could see a recursive nature in this part one, uh, in this part of the equation as in, we could like keep expanding it till we reach one. Like here we are expanding from T minus one to I guess T minus two, then T minus three and T minus four. So that's why it's here. And then at the end, we have a part that cannot be broken down. So this is similar to telescoping like in mathematics uh, derivations. Okay, also, and these equations are usually predefined in libraries like in TensorFlow and PyTorch. So it, in PyTorch, I guess it can be done with uh, autograd. Okay, so, uh, okay, so given like previously we saw that one of the ways to handle uh, uh, vanishing gradient is to use uh, it used to use uh, modified recurrent neural networks. Here, the hidden state is augmented with extra gates, such as forget gates and update gates and output gates. So what the forget gate does is like, we will forget part of the hidden state and update gate is that we will update the certain parts of the certain features of the hidden state with a new output and the output gate controls like what would be added to the output basically. So both the uh, update gate, so which one is the output? Uh, do, 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 do. Sorry, so forget gate is the reset gate, it doesn't matter. And update gate is here and, and that's it. So both reset gate and update gate uh, depend on to see, have a similar design where we have a sigmoid functions and this sigmoid function is kind of scaled, trans linearly transformed and then added. And here, so the, these are the days and this HT with this uh, tilde uh, is like a hidden like candidate that would be added, candidate hidden state that would be added to the actual hidden state. So this is scaled with a tan function. So this tan has like ranges from minus one to one. So this tan takes input with the current input xt at time step t. And then we have this use of reset gate, which uh, forgets certain part of the previous hidden state. So t minus one. So what it does like it forgets some features of the hidden state. So this is this would be done when, like suppose for a feature i, this r t is zero. So in that case, the this zero is multiplied by the i feature of this h t minus one. That would be zero. So here we are performing dot product, element wise multiplication. So yeah, that's why it, that's how it forgets. And here this is like the hidden state for the next. A time step. So this is like, uh, this is the update gate. Mm, sorry, set. Yeah, update gate. So here, update gate means like this field would be propagated or not. So if certain like the ith element of z is zero, then the the ith element of the previous instead won't be propagated. Okay, and conversely, it would be like uh, the ith convert ith element of the candidate uh, hidden state would be updated into the uh, next hidden state. Yeah. Uh, similarly, we have a little bit more complex design, LSTM, which is also older than GRU. And usually uh, GRU is, they perform closer, but 
their performance is pretty close, but LSTM performs better. However, GRU is more simpler to implement. So here in LSTM, we have like, uh, we have another the hidden state, uh, which we call as a uh, memory cell, I guess. So this memory cell is the C and the output, previously we had output generated from hidden state. Here the hidden state is the output. So here we have a, we have three gates. So there's the output gate, uh, input gate and forget gate. So they have the similar design as before, previous gates. So for the memory cells, we have this again, this still represents the candidate, candidate memory cell for current stem step. We have this 10 function. So this has this candidate uh, cell does not have any gates here. We have a, just a simple transformation. However, when we're calculating the memory cell for the current time step, we have this forked gate, uh, which kind of maps the previous uh, cell. And we have the input gate, which maps the components from the candidate cell. So here, FT is like this ZT, and IT is like one minus ZT of GRU. Okay. After we have calculated the candidate time step, we have we update the hidden hidden state with the output gate multiplied by the scaled version of the calc, uh, current memory cell. So here, ht this function acts as a uh, okay. This hidden state acts like a short term memory where, and this CT acts like a long-term memory. So how this works as a short term is that uh, this, the higher, suppose this FT is all zeros, then it would not remember previous memory cell and the current candidate memory cell would be calculated. So this would get propagated into the hidden state directly. So, so short-term memory and long-term is that Suppose it is all zero. In that case, it will just keep remembering the past, which is ct minus one. So that's how it's the long-term memory. Okay, and previously, like in the for French language, English to French, we saw that it picked the um, it picked the word with the highest probability, but that would not necessarily mean. Like, like globally, that's the best solution. Like it's an example of dynamic programming. So greedy might not usually work. So there also, we could we cannot explore all possible combination of words because uh, the number of words are huge. So it would be exponential. It, we will require exponential amount of time. So beam search is like a compromise in between where we kind of combined uh, a heuristic so here in GRIA beam search, we maintain top K candidate outputs at each time step. Uh, we expand each one in all of the V possible ways to generate VK candidates. So here V is the total number of words in the vocabulary. So in the diagram, we can see an example. So like from the initial state, like we predicted for the like time step one, we predicted the probabilities here and A and C like have the highest probabilities. So we pick A and C and we explore all possible combinations given the first word is A. And then here we see like B has the highest probability and also given C is the first word, we explore all possible probabilities and see that E has the second highest probability. So for time step T, we maintain B and E. So that, so, in a similar manner, we ex explore all the other time steps. And finally, at the final time step, we pick the word with the highest probability. So given this RNNN, we can have other different uh, neural network ar architectures for sequential data. We could have 1D CNN. So 1D means like usually CNNs are 2D uh, are applied on 2D data, but we could have 1D uh, CNNs where there's like a, it has a receptive field that kind of uh, explores the nearby words. 
So it's similar to bagging concept in NLP, like bagging and then bigrams. These are used for making word vectors. So it, we could think like this is a similar approach. So we have a 1D convolutional operation and the input could have multiple channels. Uh, so usually the, the channels are convolved separately and then the output of the channels are aggregated to produce the output. And, we, and the input size usually varies for sequential data. We could keep the outputs fixed by using max pooling. Okay, so here we try to explore like an idea, like what this is. So here, huh. so this is the word. And here we have a six channel. So here channel would be, in our case, uh, number of features of the word to vec model or one hot encoder. If it is one hot encoder, then the number of is like the number of total number of words in the vocabulary. And here, since we, we are convolving with a receptive field of two, so the number of channels in the next layer kind of decreases because this, Oh wait, sorry. Uh, so, so the length it decreases by one because if we have a receptive field of two, then so it goes like this, two and then two. And since we don't have a padding here, it kind of decreases by one. So a similar thing happens here. And the number of channel is fixed for here, like Previously we had six and then here we, we defined it to, to have it as four. So it's kind of, we have four filters. Yeah, four filters for the next layer. And this is a separate, uh, another convolution, like there are two convolutions here. Uh, and then for the output, we're doing max pooling per channel. So since there were four channel in this layer, we have four, in the output for this, for each of these channels and five here because there are five channels in this filter. Okay, finally, based on this, we could like fit it into a fully connected network and predict the output here. Okay, so this attention is like we had, a, I had a very, confusion with this attention like it could we could see it as a different form of context but like from a high level point of view we could see as mapping finding key value pairs like uh how similar the query is to a key and then mapping the value based on the sum like how similar a query is to the key so basic idea is like we have the values weighted by the similarity of the corresponding keys with the query. And we could have soft versus hard attention. So hard attention means like uh, we, we, are, we will look into a wide range of keys and then weight them. And hard attention is that we, we want to put a lot of weight on few keys and then use their probabilities. So if we use, uh, soft attention, then we can easily apply like differentiation and gradient descent. But for hard attention, we cannot do that because the peaks are too high. So usually we use recurrent network to train hard attention, to find the parameters for hard attention. Okay, well, let's look at the equations. So we have key value pairs here, like, key, like maybe M are the features total number of features is included, is indicated by M. So we have M key value pairs and attention is like Q is the query here. So attention is just the total function. So we are just like zipping it together. And here, this is this attention scoring function. So this is just a function. We are usually we train it during the model training. So this kind of is like a weighted probability for this value. Like 
for given the ith feature, what is how similar the query is to the key of this feature. And based on that similarity, we are weighting the value of that feature and just summing it up. Okay. And here, this alpha, we're looking deeper into this alpha. This alpha is like there's a sig like a softmax function. And this softmax is kind of weighing, weighing this parameter based on and scaling it, normalizing it with respect to other parameters here. And here, k is the key. Yep. So, yeah, that's it. Okay, so this attention, we could have non-parametric attention or parametric attention. Mm -hmm. By non-parametric, we mean like uh, there, there are no uh, like a fixed model, model design. And we are just using the inputs to end output. We are just using the data. And how it works is like uh, we are checking a query with all the previous input and then producing like an aggregate of the most likely output. Okay, so here the key value pairs are the in previous inputs from one to n, and then we are uh, matching the current query key with the previous input. And then we are scaling using that as a scalar for the output yi. Okay. This is similar to a kernel regression. And here, we have the kernel regression here, this one is similar to the Gaussian distribution where this alpha usually means the bandwidth. So here we can see like sig one by sigma square and we are seeing like the W went up. So basically W means one by, sorry. Uh, so yeah, you, you get that idea. Like it's just one by sigma. Yeah, sorry. Okay, so this sigma kind of uh, controls how soft or hard the attention is. So if the sigma is too high, it means like the sigma, uh, sorry, if the bandwidth is too high, then the, it means that the sigma is very low. So we are, trying, we are focusing on very few examples and Vice versa, if the bandwidth is small, then we're focusing on multiple, like a large number of surrounding words, surrounding input, and then scaling it on their output. Okay, and this, uh, uh, okay. Uh, like this F is the, like, uh, like the output we're trying to predict, this F, sorry. Yeah, so yeah, so here it is. So we are just, placing this kernel here. So here what happens so from this step to this step, we are we will normalize it anyway here. So that's why we can like detect this uh, scaling factor from this part. Yeah, we are delay, uh, we are removing uh, removing this scaling factor because we are already dividing it here so we could we could just take common and just cut them off. So yeah, that's it. But the problem is, uh, given we have billions of data parameters, it would be very impractical to run this loop all the time. So we have a parametric attention in which this dimension, input dimension, is reduced to a smaller portion. Now, this uh, parameter, like this query dimension and the reduced uh, space, feature space, they their dimensions may not match so we need to scale them to a different dimension uh, different dimension space so that we can compare them with each other so that's what we are doing so we are linearly mapping the query to that uh, to a different space and uh, we are also mapping the key to a different space and then we are adding them and comparing them so that's what is happening here so and usually the yeah, answer 10 changes from minus one to one. Okay, so yeah. And then we're just waking it. It's the same thing here. What's happening here? Uh, okay, these two are same. Okay, anyways. And then 
here we have this uh, also the calculating these uh, equations all the time can be computationally high. So this is like an approximation uh, where, uh, yeah, so we had uh, approximation and we also want to have this uh, value close to one. So how so close to one. So that's why we're dividing by root t. Here, why we're doing this? Because we want the standard deviation close to one. So it's like uh, given a one feature. Uh, so there are like d features. So given one feature, we could have a mean of zero. We are assuming that we have a mean of zero and standard deviation of one. So we, if we aggregate d features, then the standard deviation goes to d and mean is zero. So since, and to reduce that, uh like the standard deviation of the aggregate we are dividing by root t okay so we could apply this attention new contribution concept to our previous models so we had seen sec to sec so here what would happen if we just kind of demonstrate like the design if we apply attention to that model so here, this uh, this context is taking look. So sorry, uh, in the previous like sorry, um, here what is happening is like the like the first sec to sec model that we saw. Here the encoder kind of generates the final hidden state, and that hidden state is used as context. So here the context is fixed, like it's just the previous like the last hidden state of the encoder. And when we're using attention, instead of depending on the last hidden state, we, we are also looking at all the previous hidden state of the encoder and then scaling it. And then you turn making it as context vector and then using it as before. So yeah, so this. So yeah, this, so this new context is also depends on previous hidden state of the encoder. So this, uh, idea of attention is uh, expanded further in transformer models. So in transformer models, it, it basically means like it's a sec to sec model, sequence to sequence, that uses attention in both encoder and decoder instead of only on the decoder. So this to uh, so yeah, recently like these transformers have been like magical. Like it's I I, was, I still don't understand how they work, but they kind of perform way better than all the other previous models. Okay, so there are different concepts in transformers that we need to understand, uh, which these concepts are then used together to implement the whole thing. So one of the concept is self-attention. So self-attention is very simple. It means like the encoder kind of attends to itself. So previously we saw like the decoder is, is like, attending to paying attention to the encoder. So here at an encoder is paying attention to itself. So in the case of encoder, we have for the output, we have pairs of input where both the key and value is the word. And yeah, that's goes like this. And then to use this at decoder, uh, we are like feeding the output of the previous so output of the previous time step as input as the next time step. And uh, yeah, that's it. And also we can also train, uh, okay, sorry. Oh, sorry, I have to add a charge. Yeah, sorry about that. Okay, so, 
Also, the another advantage of transformers is that we can train them in parallel because we already have the output for the decoder. Uh, so we can like, you know, predict, uh, train them in parallel basically, like given if the number of sentence length is n, so we could have n uh, processes where training each of the positions. Okay. Uh, there's another problem with, uh, sorry, not a problem, like a feature. So transformers are like positional invariant. They don't have like, they don't have understand, like inherently understand difference between the first word or the second word. So they don't maintain the sequence. So in order to incorporate uh, sequential information, we use positional encoding where we try uh, aggregate the input with additional features that like demonstrate where the position, like add a orderly uh, value to it basically. So it would mean like a word that's earlier than us, that a certain word would have a lower value for the positional encoder. Another concept for transformers is multi-headed attention. This is simply means like using multiple attention layers and then aggregating them. So here we have this I representing the I uh, attention. So yeah, that's it. And given at the end, we have we kind of uh, stack all the attentions and then scale it to produce the output, produce the like a aggregate final attention for the model. So yeah, that's it. And there's the attention here and we are conc concatenating here, it's like in this part and then sending it to the dense layer. So we're going to put all the concepts that like the three concepts that we saw previously and add it together to form the transformer. So here it's a bit complicated, but Basically, it's having an encoder block that is being applied multiple times based on n, where where this n is probably the length of the word, length of the sentence. So we have this input, and this input is getting first uh, this. So here, first this input, and this input gets an input embedding. So this embedding could be that globe or like word to vector or others, other encoding. And then this embedding is then updated with positional encoding that to incorporate positional data. And then this, then, then this is pushed into multi-headed attention. Okay, and this multi-headed attention is then scaled and pushed into feed forward. And then this feed forward is pushed into like the next layers. So this is the encoding block here. So what's happening? So we can see here, we have this query, uh, keys, uh, values. So this is getting into multi headed attention. And then for normalizing the layer, we also adding the input. It's like a peep through, like uh, uh, like in the model, we, we can sometimes have like, inputs pushing into the next layers. So that's what's happening here where you're like pushing this X into the output so that uh, we can reduce the loss when, when it comes to the gradient descent. So this Z is then feed forwarded into some sort of uh, fully connected network. And then we are also normalizing it and then returning it, okay. Or the encoder, it's so the, sorry. Uh, this is the decoder, most likely. Yeah, so this encoder is this, this left part, and this is the decoder. So this encoder kind of uses this encoder block to run n times. So first we have x and this n. So first we are going to embed this x, which is done here. And then we are adding positional information. And then this is a run on itself with on the encoder block and then running it, returning the E. 
Okay, so now we are looking to the decoder part. So this decoder has a decoder block and this is a bit more complicated than the encoder one, obviously, but so it, but the concepts are pretty similar. We have this multi-attention that runs on the output, like, uh, okay, so here the keys are the output and yeah, these keys are output. Okay, so first we have this layer. Okay, so here this output is shifted, right? So what it basically means, like these are the output in the previous time step, which are shifted, right? So suppose we are in time step three. So for time step three, the input would be output from one to time step two. So that's what it means, shifted, right? So we have this query queue, which is the output and the keys and values, all of them are output. And then we are pushing into multi-head and then scaling it. And here, uh, sorry, so there some somewhere here, I don't know. Okay, and then we are layering it out. And then it's like similar to the previous encoder block. For the decoder, we have this output and encoded, in encoded hidden state from the encoder and n is the length. So first we will embed the encoder, like embed the output and then add positional information as before and then just run it with the decoder. Okay, so now we are going to make comparisons like with self-attention and recurrent neural networks and convolution neural networks. So we can see the basic like differences in design. So RNN kind of takes one input at a time and then pushing it, pushing uh, positional like sequential relationships at a hidden state layer. So it can, so if the, uh, the nodes don't have a direct relationship, like a direct connection to the out inputs but they have to go through the hidden state basically. In CNN, we have a receptive field that kind of expands into the layers. Like as the higher we go, the higher receptive fields we have. So what do we, what I mean by that is that, so from like we, like the difference between to get a connection from X to five, we have to go to layer two. So jumping here and then here. So if we're here, in this position, then we have a view of both of this. Yeah, we have a view of this size, like a size of five. But if we are in here in this position, then we have a view of only three nodes. So that's what I mean by a receptive field. So, but in self attention, like every node kind of has a connection to all the other nodes. So it's like a like a one step position. So this is indicated here. So for example, if we want the information of X1, we need to like go through linearly back five steps. So this is represented in this here, like ON. So that what it means here, like it, it depends, linearly depends on the length of the sentence. And here we have a log KN because it, like we can see like given this five to get like information from one to x, we need log k, log, like k is the receptive field size. Sorry, not a system, it's just uh, like the size of the filter basically. So that's k. So we need a shorter length of so log k n. And here o1 because all of them are connected to each other. So o1, like it's a direct one step push, uh, approach. Okay. And this complexity thing is like how much time we need to train it. So self-attention since it kind of depends directly on the data. So it, it also really like it. So this N is the size of the data. So it's kind of checking all possible pairs of data with each other. So that's why N square and D is probably the size of the features. 
Okay, in the re recurrent neural network, since we are seeing each data item once, like for training this node, we are seeing this output, this input only once. So that's why it's n. And d is like we are, so d square means we are pairing each in like hidden node with each other. That's why d square. And for convolutional case, probably means like the, yeah, case the size of the filter. That's it. Okay, there are other like very different applications and variations of transformers, but they all use the same concepts. So for we have some famous encoders like Elmo. So yeah, Elmo, BERT, and GPT. They're usually used for NLPs, NLP tasks, and natural like and of natural language processing so we could so they can also be char characterized by differences in how they implement low rank kernels or memories or whether they use recurrence or not or how many learnable parameters they have or whether it's fixed or randomized parameters so yeah that's it that's the end of my presentation and these are the resources that are like frequently mentioned in the chapters and I checked them out and they're pretty good. So yeah, so this deep into deep learning is like a book by like scientists in Amazon and Hugging Face is from Facebook. So this course is pretty good for transforming, uh, for learning transformers and also found this blog pretty useful. Yeah, that's it. Okay, Mike, the last question. Yeah, so- uh, Oh, sorry, uh, I missed the question. So what was the question? I tried Can to I... answer it. Yeah. Uh, which slide is it? It's the one that had all the formulas. Uh, wait, so let... For sorry. the recurrent neural network. Okay, so let me go there. uh okay first of all like yeah i'm not an expert but just saying okay which which slide 11 oh ppt oh yeah sorry sorry, sorry. yeah this one uh okay Okay, so like I also have don't have a clear idea, but I can give like like an idea of what, what I understood. So here this is the loss, like L represents like the loss for a particular sentence. So this this I, this sentence has T words. Uh, sorry. Okay, so suppose this sentence has uh, T words. So this T is the, this capital T and this loss is kind of identifying. So we are predicting Y, I, okay. And this I has kind of an output O, like, like suppose the first letter is I for uh, for this given input, like, uh, uh, okay, so, uh, J, uh, just uh, for a particular language, it may suppose, suppose the input is, uh, my name is Pinku. So uh, for in French, it would be Jesui Pinku, maybe I don't know for what, so, given the first word is I, so we are trying, the output is J. Okay, so, but we may be predicting the Y as I don't know, suppose uh, two. So, so there's a difference here. So this difference has a loss associated with it. This loss is like represented in this uh, term. So similarly, there would be loss for each of the positions and then this loss is aggregated and then scaled by t. So this scaling is done because we could have different sizes of sentences. So like a large, if we don't, wish we didn't have this term, then a large sentence would naturally have a large error. 
So we're trying to normalize that. So that's why there's one by T. Okay, now we are applying differentiation on this loss based in terms of uh, WH. Okay, so where did this WH come from? So this WH came from this weight vector for the hidden state. Yes, that's the way. Okay, so then we are trying, we will like expand it by like chain my chain rule. So here this loss. So we are now differentiating this loss in terms of the output. So this is this is usually pretty simple, just a linear like like a value, like uh, I don't know, like if they match. So usually like a cross entropy, or yeah, cross entropy in, in that sense. Like if they don't match, then they kind of add a value to it, and if they match, then this is zero. And since we are summing it up, so. Yeah, it doesn't crash basically. If it's, it was a multiplication, then a zero would crash the whole thing. Okay, so, and then we want, after getting this, we're trying, we will, would want to cancel this out. So this is canceled by this term. So how to cancel this? So oh, this, oh, so wait, uh, we would expect that this would be delta OT. So this O is being replaced because here O T is this term. So this W goes here. Sorry, uh, and H T is here. So this is this basically is this function G H T. So since G H T is O T, so we are replacing it here, and then we are differentiating by del H T. Sorry, sorry, sorry. So then we are differentiating this with respect to ht. And then, yeah, why, we, we are, why are we doing this? We're doing this because there's only one term here. If there were more than one, then probably it would get like more complicated, like more, like if there were two terms, then there would have been like a bracket and then another term. So since there's only one, like, uh, independent fact, uh, variable here, that's why we have this. And then we, are, we will finally remove this HT by differentiating this with respect to WH. So this HT is here and we are differentiating with WH. So which one is WH? This one. Yeah, this, is, this has to be because, yeah. The, okay. So now we are expanding this further here. So what is this HT? So this HT, this HT can be simplified for now, like with this function. So that's why it's here. Now, <clears throat> well, we have two terms here because there are two terms here. So this one probably represents uh, this one. Okay, so this term is for this one, this part. Sorry, uh, let me clear it. Uh, and this one is this. Okay, and how did we get here? Uh, why are we doing this? Oh yeah, right. So we are finding HT in terms of WH. So we can directly place, like differentiate this with respect to this. And then uh, this term remains, or we could also have this term. Now this, okay. First of all, when we differentiate with respect to WH, if we assume that this ht minus one does not depend on ws, then this becomes zero. This cancels out and only this term remains. However, this ht minus one is just ht in the previous time step. So obviously it depends on wh, right? So that's why we are expanding this further uh, and we are expanding this further and then differentiating 
h t minus one with respect to w h. So that's why it's here. So we are differentiating h t minus one with respect to w h, and then and then multiplying this term with by differentiating this h t with respect to h t minus one. So we are adding this. So this is basically a recursive function. So this is basically this term in the previous time step. So if we expand this further, uh, probably if t is, so we would probably have t terms here, right? So if suppose this is t, t is equal to two. So this is for time step two, and this is for time step one. And similarly, like if there are t's, then t terms. So this is a recursive relationship. Okay. Now, yeah, so basically this, so I'm deriving myself. Okay, so this recursive relationship is like, like shown here, basically. So we are summing it up. So these terms are summed here. Okay, this is a bit complicated. So this term goes here and here's the T terms. Uh, do, 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 do. Okay. Okay, we, let's try to expand for t time step, uh, next time step, basically. So we have this, so we are trying to differentiate this part. So this will basically be this term multiplied by that. So how to do this? Uh, so this term goes here. And then we are we'll be expanding this here. Um, basically, you can like figure this out, but yeah, it, like it's not that complicated. But like we have to write a lot of things. But yeah, basically that. But, like uh, every next term would have a like a like an increasing multiplying factor. So. This is the recursive term, right? So in the next recursive term, we will have this term for each of the terms for this. And when we recurse from this to the next step, we'll have two terms, like multiplied to each of those steps. So that like, like an aggregate of the factors is represented by this multiplication part. Yeah. So yeah, that's it. Like it's not that clear, but. Okay, so that was actually pretty clear. Yeah. Um, so uh, are there any other questions? No, okay, Wilson, well, thank you very much Finkoof, for doing this. Yeah. I know it was a very short notice. Yeah, I think it's a, very short uh, presentation. Uh, also. Yeah. <laughs> and, no, actually they, they usually last about an hour, so it's good. Yeah, and okay. you, you actually covered a lot of uh, material. Um, yeah. Will you be able to send me your slides afterwards? Yeah, sure. Okay, okay. So I'll post the recording in the slides. Yeah. So uh, um, post the, okay, yeah. okay, okay, sure. Yeah, just uh, email them to me. Yeah, um, sure. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody, and um, I guess we'll meet back here next week. For uh, we'll be moving on to the section four of the book. So thanks again, and uh, have a have a good night, everybody.